Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to our virtual talk, Bird Mania, an introduction to birding. I'm so glad that y'all could join us today. Uh, before we get started with our guest speaker, I just wanted to, to talk about a few things. I wanted to tell you about the Phil Harburger Park Conservancy. We are a donation-based nonprofit that bridges the gap between San Antonio and nature by bringing free nature programs to the public. Uh, we also help to protect the natural habitat of the park through advocacy, fundraising, and promotion. Um, if you enjoy the programs that we offer, please consider supporting us through a donation or becoming a member. Um, you can visit philharbergerpark.org to learn more. Uh, I also want to let you know that today's uh, um, talk will be recorded and shared on our website. So if you could please turn off your microphone and video, we would really appreciate it. And uh, questions will be answered at the end of the talk. So if you uh, have any questions, please post them to the chat and Patsy and Tom will answer as many as they can, time permitting. If they are not able to get to all the um, questions, you can email them at tpinglet at satx.rr.com. I have also placed their email in the chat so you can copy and paste it for later. Um, and if you haven't already, you can download the handouts for today's talk on our website, and you can also find the link in our chats. I'm sending it right now. Um, well, without further ado, today we have Tom and Patsy Inglet here to speak with us about birding. I will let them handle their own introductions, but I want to let you know I've had the pleasure to hear them speak on several occasions, and they are very excellent for, uh, at what they do. So take it away, Patsy. Well, thank you very much. I hope everyone can see our slides. If you can't, please let Teresa know. <laughs> uh, and uh, we are uh, Patsy and Tom Inglet. We are bookends. We come as a set. We are birding buddies, and uh, we've been together for a very long time. Uh, today, we're here for our birding basics workshop. It's going to be fast, so please put on your fast ears, or we're going to go through some tools, tips, and techniques to build your birding skills. Now, that's no matter where you're starting. Uh, if you're just beginning with your birding, and a lot of people are, with us confined so close to home, a lot of people have discovered birds outside their window, and they want to know, now, what are those birds and what are they doing? Uh, some people have been birding for a while and they just want to have some uh, tips and techniques to help make that experience less frustrating and more productive. So wherever you are in your birding, we hope that we have something that will help you and that will add to your enjoyment of this wonderful um, avocation that we have discovered. So let's go on to it. We're going to go straight through. And as Teresa said, it will be recorded. So if you need to listen to something again, or if you have a questions, we'll try to answer those at the end. So let's get started. And the first question, let me get over here where I can get my computer going, is why bird? Well, birding has a lot of uh, rewards and birds themselves uh, are very important to people. So if we look at what people have told us, uh, in our conversations with them about why they enjoy birding and birds. There's a whole list of things. Birds themselves are beautiful. They symbolize all kinds of wonderful things. They do mysterious and marvelous things like migration from one pole to the other. They're out when we are, they're visible and accessible. Some people like to keep lists of their birds and that appeals to their collector's instincts. And we can do it by ourselves. We can do it socially under most conditions. And people, sometimes people even do it competitively. Uh, we're more into the, um, I would say, scientific and social part of birding. But sometimes we do little competitions. Now, the last three things on here I think are very important for us all to consider. Birding is good for our total health. For one thing, physically, it gets you outside and it gets you um, moving. You have to move to bird and some people who are even confined to wheelchairs can or, or other mobility problems can enjoy birding we have paths for that and uh, we also have mental challenges with birding we have to figure it out and that keeps us sharp mentally and it also collect connects us to something bigger than ourselves which is nature and all that nature and all of its complexities and interactions the thing that I really liked about birding when I started was the second one on the red. It expands our perception and enjoyment of nature. If you, if you uh, walk along with somebody who's a naturalist or, and or a birder, you notice that they're noticing things that maybe you missed. And that's what it does. It opens our minds and eyes and ears 
all of us to uh, everything that nature can offer us. And very important to uh, Tom and I, we're very active in the Audubon Society and in other organizations that uh, are concerned with the conservation of birds. Birds are uh, populations all over the world are in decline. And we're interested in conserving their habitat and those populations. And if we're birding and we're interested in birds, we will help do that. So the adventure you start today or continue if you've already started birding can last a lifetime. We have a young birders club. We have kids that start when they're still in the pouch on their mom's back and they you can continue up uh, as long as you are on the planet. There are birds to um, observe and enjoy. But we do have a little caveat that we like to tell people. We warning birding can become addicted. After a while, you may consider your what look in magazines for new binoculars or another place to go, birding and so forth. But we consider it a magnificent obsession. And it's added so much to our life, especially since we retired and got even more active in birding. So here are the three principles we're going to teach you today about how to take your birding farther or further. Uh, first is preparing before you go. And today's class is part of that um, to learn a little bit more, maybe to uh, prevent yourself from making too many mistakes too many times. When we started, we didn't, we didn't take that rule. And uh, we made a lot of mistakes and we made them a lot of times. So we're hoping to save you that frustration. Uh, we're going to share with you today a systematic ID method that has proven helpful to a lot of people. And uh, we'll teach it to you. We, we, we're into teaching principle and then you go and apply it. And then of course, we're going to do a little bit of practice today. We can't, what we really like to do is teach this class and then do a bird walk. Uh, as part of it, but of course that's not possible right now. But we're going to go through a few little examples to help you to jumpstart your practice after this class. All right, so prepare before you go. Start with what you already know. I was a teacher for a lot of years. I taught biology and chemistry and some stuff like that. And um, I found that if you were trying to teach somebody something new, you had to find a way to hook it to something they were already familiar with. Well, fortunately, with birds, most people are familiar with them, at least the ones that hang out around our homes and uh, our neighborhoods. Now, here's a bird that most people in our area have seen, if you've been here for any length of time. Some people even know its official name. Birds in all over the world now have an official common name. They also have a scientific name, but mostly we use the common names in birding. So most people know that this is a cardinal, its official name is the Northern Cardinal because it comes, it's a member of a family that comes to North America. That's the Northern part. So everybody's seen this bird. Now I'm gonna play a little trick on you here. I'm gonna black it out. And I'm gonna ask you some questions so that you can ask yourself. What color is a Cardinal's eye? What color is a Cardinal's beak? What shape is a Cardinal's beak? Does it have any other colors on it besides the red for which it's named? Does it have any other features that you notice very quickly? What's the proportion of its tail length to its body length? Oh my goodness. If you can't answer any of those they questions, legs. they have legs. What color are their legs? Tom's chiming in back here. Uh, so if, if any of those questions leave you saying, uh, I don't know, that's the perceptual opening we're talking about. Now, you're gonna have your birder eyeballs on now. And everybody usually goes straight to looking at the eyeball. Yeah. And now we know without a doubt in our mind that Cardinal has a black eye, okay? They have an orange beak. It is shaped like a big triangle. It's for crushing seeds. It has black mask around the face and the eye is in the mask. It has that crazy crest, that they, we notice right off. You can't see very well the um, tail, but here it is right here. The tail is about the same length as the body. It has these pinky gray feet. So you can see a lot about that cardinal that maybe you hadn't noticed before, okay? Now, here's why that is very important. When we see a bird, this is the systematic scientific part. Systematic and scientific thinking involves compare and contrast. Compare shows the similarities and contrast highlights the differences. Now, when we look at these two birds on the screen now, and we know the one on the left is a Northern Cardinal, 
we say, how are they alike? Well, they have the same kind of eye, the same kind of beak, the same color beak, the same color eye, they have a mass, they have a crest, they have the same proportion, the same legs. The only real difference is the main body color. And in fact, these birds are so similar that it turns out that they are the same species, the male on the left and the female on the right. Okay, so let's take another bird. Here we have a bird that a lot of people in the city especially see around their house and here, they're very loud. And uh, it is called a blue jay, that's its official name. It doesn't look a lot like the other bird, the cardinal that we looked at. Look at the bee. I bet everybody knows what color its eye is. You know, first thing we look at is that eye. It has a line through the eye, has a little crest, has a totally different beak, it's got a little hook on the end, a totally different color pattern. The proportion is not all that different, tail's about the same length, but it's easy to see that it's a different bird. When we compare and contrast the cardinal and the blue jay, they're different enough that we are certain that they're a different species, and they may even be in a different group of birds, which we call family. So this is how we work. We come up, and one of your handouts that you can download uh, is this sheet with some other information on the back. And it is 16 birds that are very common. They come from all different groups of birds that are common around San Antonio. And what this is intended to be is a reference set. These are birds you see often or can see often, sometimes at your feet or sometimes around your yard. If there are other birds that you see more commonly, then you can certainly create your own set of birds that I know. And what we would recommend is going into a bird book, looking these things up and learning as much about them as possible. Going online or with a, uh, an app for your phone, listening to them, what kind of sounds do they make? Really get to know them as your neighbors, just like your neighbors that your human neighbors. You can see them from a mile down the road and you know who that is just uh, by their shape or what kind of Bermuda shorts they wear, you know, that kind of thing. So this is the reference set that we use for our compare and contrast. Once we get to know these usual suspects very well, then we use them as reference. Now, if we see a bird that we've never seen before, and let's say you go out to Mitchell Lake and you see this bird and you say, eh, I don't know what that is which bird in our reference set is it more, most like? Well, if you look at those 16 birds, I think most people would agree that it looks very much like kind of a cardinal. Maybe it's in the same group of birds as a cardinal. It has a crest, it has got red on it, it's got a mask, but there are significant differences. So we know it is not a female cardinal because female cardinals have an orange beak. So maybe it's a cardinal's cousin. So we go into a field guide, and if we get a good field guide, and Tom's going to talk about those in just a minute, all the birds in a bird family are going to be listed in the same section of the book, so we can compare and contrast easily. So if we look up here, here's our cardinals. Here's the male with his crest up and down, the female with her crest up and down, and I even have one here with a little gray beak. That's Cardinal Junior. That's a baby. Right now, we're seeing lots of those around our house. Takes them a while to get that red beak. But look on the same page. Do you see a bird that looks like the one we're trying to identify? Yep, there it is. Turns out it's a cardinal's cousin. They're in the same family called the gross beaks, which is German for big beak. They both have big beaks, but they have significant differences and they are a different species. This one's called a pyroloxia or a pyroloxia. Some people call it a Western cardinal because you usually find them out in the drier Western area. So that's what we're talking about using our reference. We'll go into that a little bit more. The other thing you can do is prepare before you go. If besides your reference set of the birds you know well, you can go and get a bird list of wherever you're gonna go bird. Here's a bird list for the Cibolo Nature Center. You can get off, uh, get, get at the center. Here's one from eBird, which we'll talk about later. It's an online list of birds. You can pull it right off the website and say, I'm gonna to go to the Kerr Wildlife Management. I wanna know what birds I can expect to see. And you can study before you go and be ready for what you're gonna see at that place so that you, anything new will be not as 
foreign as it could be. Okay, now the second thing we need to do to take our uh, to get ready is to equip ourselves with essential birding tools and to learn to use them effectively. So Tom's going to go over really quickly uh, field guides and binoculars. So we shift thrones here. So one of the first things, probably the first things most people think of if they want to be able to identify birds to know more about what they see. I mean, you can't look it up, you can't Google it, you can't do anything if you don't know a name. And the best way to do that is to use a bird guide. There are many, many bird guides nowadays, and they are, most of them are very good. Here we've got a picture of four of them that uh, we use all of them. We use more than this from time to time because each of them has little bit differences. But any of these, excuse me, any of these, oh, hit the wrong button, <laughs> tell him it's him. Uh, the, um, all of, all of the uh, modern field guides that are, that are really good, uh, they're gonna have fine illustrations of the birds and they'll have, uh, typically they have more than one view, more than one picture. They'll uh, have a, a little write up that'll give you some more detail about uh, where the bird is and this and that and the other, and maybe some uh, interesting aspects of its behavior. They'll include a distribution. Uh, they'll include a range map which shows the distribution of the bird, where it is in uh, uh, on Earth. Uh, not necessarily its habitat. You need to text for that, but at least you will be able to know the general area. They are organized in scientific order. They're not by color. Uh, there are some by color, but that's kind of squirrely. Because <laughs> which color would you look for if you saw the female cardinal versus the male cardinal, right? So um, they all have their pros and cons. Everybody has their preference. Patsy and I typically, when we go out uh, birding, we actually carry two different uh, guidebooks because different ones show different aspects and talk about different things. And we like a lot of them actually. Uh, but a really important aspect is they're only helpful to the extent that we actually use them. And when do I think that we should use them? Well, I think you should use them before, during, and after you go out birding. Before you go out, it's like Patsy just briefly mentioned, you, you, you get a list, you pay attention to what might be the suspects for where you're going, and you actually learn about them there, there at home before you go. And then that helps you move along and makes you feel better about when you see them, you can identify them. Then during, if you see something and you're not real sure, you can reference the book after the bird flies off, I might add, not before. And so you can use that to determine what the bird is that you're looking. And then the after part, a lot of people don't think about this, but it is really useful that once you get back to the house, after you've been birding, go through the book and really look at all the detail about the birds that you saw. You, it'll be amazing. There'll be things that you think, well, I didn't see that. But the next time you look at that bird, you will see it. And so it'll really sharpen your, uh, sharpen your skills. Here, I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. This is the same example Patsy used a moment ago. Uh, this is the Ken Kaufman guides. Kaufman uses uh, digitally enhanced uh, photographs. Uh, that's what he puts in his books. By enhanced, I mean they uh, in, accentuate things that the different guides, different authors will accentuate different things or draw your attention because it's the thing they think is the most important. And that's why often it's a good idea to have more than one. And um, so this is one very, very good one. And I'll contrast this book with the National Geo. The National Geographic Guide is also a very good guide. They actually use paintings. And so they have the paintings of the birds. And they also give you the benefit of giving you some uh, habitat inclination. In other words, they, they may paint the picture of the bird uh, in its natural environment or with a plant that it might use in its uh, making a living. 
and the the there is a reference sheet that uh, is in the uh, uh, resources that we provided that actually lists uh, a number of bird guides and many other things as well that uh, you may avail yourself to. Binoculars are the next thing most people think about because they see something but they can't tell what they they can't see the detail and so they need binoculars and binoculars come in a lot of shapes and sizes. I think this little compact set here would be real handy to <laughs> hang around your neck. They'd be dangling down to your knees, but they come in all colors and sizes, little bitty guys. They come in these offsets kind. They come in a straight barrel. They come in all different shapes, sizes, and magnifications, what have you. But all of them will have something uh, typically in common. Somewhere on them, there will be a uh, a pair of numbers like 842, 1050, 735. What those mean, those numbers. The first number means the magnification. It means the, the binocular will cause the image to look seven times closer or 10 times closer. The second number is, in fact, the diameter of the light gathering in, not the eye in, but the outside in, the objective lens. And so that's the diameter of the lens that gathers the light. And when you divide the power into that diameter, what that defines is the diameter of the light circle that is coming out the eyepiece in that comes to your eye. You would like that number for birding, actually for most anything it'd be best, but if you, for birding particularly, you want that quotient to be about five. Five millimeters is about the diameter of a pupil. So therefore, uh, <laughs> your pupil. <laughs> yeah. And so what that does, yeah, not a snake's pupil. And so it, it gives you all the light you can use, but you're not carrying around a bunch of extra glass to get a bigger light source than you can use, nor are you getting something so tiny you can't, can't uh, see the detail. And binoculars come in these two different shapes. One is this, this uh, what I will call the older style. What, when I grew up, that's all I ever saw was these. I'm sure the others existed. But these poro prisms are offset. And inside, there's all kinds of lenses and prisms, what have you. The uh, roof prism is the straight through ones. That's this guy over here. And, but in both cases, there's lots of glass in there, lots of pieces in there. And that's the thing that makes the difference in the quality of binoculars is the quality of the glass and the coatings that they put on that glass to uh, modify the uh, uh, shift of the light color. And all bird worthy binoculars, by that we mean something that you should uh, look for in, in binoculars for birding. One, you want them to be comfortable and adjustable to your eyes and your face with or without your glasses, depending on how you're gonna do it. And then they also need to be bright. They need to be easy to focus. You don't wanna to have to turn the wheel 12 times to get it to focus from where you were before. You want a, a good size field of view. By that, I mean, you it, when you look through it, at a, say at 100 yards, is how wide is the picture? The wider, the better in a lot of senses. So it's a difference of whether you're looking down a BB gun barrel or a 12 gauge shotgun barrel. Okay, they need to be an accurate color rendition. You, I've had, I've experienced, what do you want? Nothing. Uh, the, uh, where you get some really inexpensive ones and everything's got a blue hue. Well, you don't want that, you want good color. No distortions, no fog up, that's usually not a problem nowadays. And one of the keys is don't break your budget. But at the same time, I would advise to stretch your budget because you're not gonna get you a new set next week or next month or next year probably. So get the very, very best you can because it's really important because what you choose is gonna make a world of difference in your experience with those binoculars. And so we would advise to spend what you can to get binoculars. And next, we will go a little bit further Okay, and uh, there's also a reference sheet in the handouts that we provided that tell you about uh, buying binoculars and all that stuff that Tom was, just went over. Uh, at the end of this session, uh, Tom's going to show you how to set the binoculars to your face 
the last five minutes of the class. So uh, that's also on, on the sheet. Now, once we're ready to go out, we've prepared ourselves and we're ready, and we want to know how to identify a bird, we want to use a syst systematic scientific ID method. Um, and we have in our handout a little uh, memory aid uh, to help you remember when you are uh, ide identifying a bird, it's kind of like being a detective and a scientist. You want as much data, as much uh, many clues as you can before you come to the conclusion of what bird that is. And a lot of people, since we're all human here, uh, we are very color biased as humans. And people sometimes will look at a color and they'll jump to a conclusion. But there's plenty more that we need to notice about the bird before we come to that conclusion. We wanna be more certain of our identification. And to do that, we have this little way of remembering, it's play chess backwards. And you see the letters of chess, the letters are S, S, E, H, C backwards, and then play at the bottom. And each one has a, a feature or a piece of data or um, a clue that we wanna be sure we get if we can. Now, we don't necessarily have to do it in this order, but we want to be sure we try to gather all this information. So the first one is sound. I hope you can hear that. It's a bird singing. Now, it gets us looking where that bird is singing from. And we start to look around for where the sound's coming from and we see this gorgeous little thing. It's a painted bunting. And it's just a, a beautiful little bird. And then we can watch it. Now, if we study the sounds of birds, we can learn to identify them by their sound. But that is a different class and we don't have time to go into all the ins and outs of that. But it at least gets our eyes on the bird. Now, in some cases, it really helps in our ID. These are two wrens that we have. I, we have both in our backyard. Carolina is the, the more red bird here, and then the little grayer one. They both have a white eyebrow and a curved beak and a cocktail. They look very like, much like wrens. And if you don't get a good look at them and they scurry off into the underbrush, you might say, ooh, was that a Carolina or a Buick's wren? But listen to their calls. This is a Carolina. You hear it on your back porch every morning. Here's the Buicks. Now, it doesn't take much to understand that those two are different birds. So if you didn't get a good look at the bird and the bird starts to sing, that can help you uh, as a very important clue. So it depends on um, if it just gets your eyes on it or sometimes it can be very important. Now, the second one is silhouette. And this is one that beginner birders a lot of times ignore to their peril because it's, it gives you a lot of information. Now, Tom made these, um, these are all black birds because we don't want you to be swayed by the color. This, this is a silhouette. You often see birds on the wire, on a fence, they're backlit and they look just like this. But look at how much you can uh, see on a bird. You can see um, the shape of its head, the shape of its beak, the general size is uh, this, what's the shape of the tail? What's the way it's sitting? Uh, does it have anything, uh, anything interesting on its head? How does it hold its tail up or down and so forth? Now, the importance of this, and we'll go through these uh, a little bit one at a time, is that it kind of gets you an idea of what bird family you're looking at. Most people would probably recognize this as a dove, dovey thing. Okay, we've seen that silhouette before. And the important thing is it tells you where to go in your book. All the doves are in one section. You don't have to look at the other 300 and some odd pages in the book, you know where to go. So it makes it much easier. Now when we're talking about size, size is difficult to gauge in the, in the field. But if you have your reference sheet, here's three reference birds that a lot of people use. A house sparrow, that's the little sparrow at HEB that goes cheep, cheep, cheep. And it's a small bird. We have robins and we have like cardinals and blue jays that are kind of medium sized birds. Then we have the bigger birds like the crows and even bigger are the, are the, the hawks and so forth. So if you have three birds that you know pretty well what the size is, 
then if you see another bird, you can say, oh, it's about the size of a house sparrow, or it's about the size of a robin, that kind of thing. And uh, so you have to get your own kind of a uh, standard that you really have a feel for. Now, we can also use one bird to figure out the size of the other one. This is three birds on a beach, not, not in Texas, but somewhere else. Uh, but they all come in Texas. This is the sanderling. This is the little bird that chases the waves. It runs up as the waves come in and it runs back when the waves go out. It's a very small shorebird. And we can, if we know that bird, which is an easy one to learn, we can gauge the size of these other two shorebirds against that. Now, the other thing we can do, here we have two woodpeckers that look very much alike. And uh, they have the same markings. One's a lot bigger than the other, but sometimes it's hard to tell. But one has a much shorter beak in relation to the length of its head. This one's beak is about the same length as of the head. This one has a shorter beak. This is a downy woodpecker. This is a hairy woodpecker. And so using that one part of the bird to measure against the other is very helpful at times. The silhouette of the shape. These are all raptors or birds of prey. And you can see they, they have very different shaped wings. People who do bird counts of raptors use the shape, the silhouette, uh, to tell whether it's an eagle or an osprey or a falcon or another kind of uh, raptor. So it can be, and it takes some study, but after a little study, you can see it way far away and, and figure out what it is. Now, proportion, the length of the legs, the length of the beak, how, uh, how, and both of those. Here we have a very long beak, very long legs. Here we have little short squatty birds with short beaks. So a lot of times that will also help you to know which one you're looking at. And how are they sitting? Some birds sit very erect. Some of them are usually parallel to the branch. Some of them are close to the ground and, and, and squatty and some of them are up. Some of them have uh, are in motion a lot. <laughs> this is the giant hummingbird here. And then some of them sit kind of parallel to the, to the wire. This is a swallow. So uh, uh, how they sit is important. Now, as far as bird families go, uh, there are about 10,700 species of birds on the planet. Uh, in Texas, we get about 650 of about 1,000 birds that come to North America. Now, the largest bird is on the planet today is the African ostrich, about eight feet tall. And the smallest bird on the planet today is a little hummingbird that lives in Cuba. It's called the bee hummingbird, and it's about the size of a big bee. But they all have one thing in common. They all have feathers. They all have the general characteristics of a bird. Fortunately, they come in families. There's, a, there's some characteristics that kind of group them together. And the big divide is of 10,700 species, about half of them, a little more than half, about 60%, are the little songbird perching birds, the kind that we see in our backyard and come to our feeders a lot. The other 40% are the other kinds of birds that are not that perching bird, songbird type. Let me give you some examples of the non-perching bird types. In uh, the Kaufman Field Guide, this is another thing we like about him, his guide is that he gives you these groups in color, in color backgrounds and also in uh, pictures. So if you're looking for a particular kind of bird, you can find a picture of it and say, oh, it's in that blue section and it's got a little tab on the side that's blue and you can turn right to that, that section of the bird. So here's some things that you would find in that 40% of the birds on the planet that are not our little songbird types. We have ducks. Most people recognize the ducky profile, okay? So we would go to that section of the book if we see something we think is a duck, a goose, or a swan. We have the hawk, eagles, birds of prey that come out in the daytime. They have this hooked beak for tearing meat and the talons for catching things. So those are the birds of prey. We have the nocturnal birds of prey. Most people recognize owls. They have a very characteristic profile. Then we have the big wading birds with the long legs, the long neck, and the dagger beaks that walk around in the water. And uh, 
Then we have the shorebirds that poke around in the dirt uh, or the sand or the mud along the shoreline. That's another group of birds. We have the hummingbirds. Most people recognize those readily. Woodpeckers, which usually sit up straight or are parallel to the branch. They have a certain characteristic beak. They even have a special kind of foot for going straight up a tree. But we recognize the woodpecker profile. These are pretty easy. Now, when we get into the 60% of the birds that are passerine birds or songbirds, or what they're called, that's the second half of the book. You see in Kaufman, he has those divided up into the families as well. You have a handout called the eight major passerine families. Passerine is the perchy birds, the songbirds. And here are the, uh, some of the main ones that you'll see. The flycatchers that sit out, catch, fly out and catch a flying insect, come back and eat it. We have a vermilion cat flycatcher and a scissor tail flycatcher and an Eastern Phoebe, all in that family. There's a lot of other ones too. Thrushes, kind of portly, kind of, kind of fat belly looking little birds. We have the robin and the Eastern bluebird here that are members of that family. Thrashers, mimics. This is our state bird, the, the mockingbird, the northern mockingbird. And there's other birds in that family that tend to copy sounds of other birds and have some of the same characteristics. The jays, like the one we know as the blue jay, have a family. Down in South Texas, we have green jays. We have scrub jays in the hill country. All have very similar birds. We have crows and ravens. Both of them are huge blackbirds and the ravens are much bigger than the crows. Ravens are more common in our area than even crows. They're black in color and they have that formidable beak. Then we have our little feeder fanatics, the chickadees with the round head and the titmice with the crazy little crest that come and instead of crushing seeds, they hatch it open. They hold the seed under their foot, watch them at your feeder and they'll peck it open. The, they are cousins, these birds. And then we have our wrens, and they're like a little round ball with a curved beak and a cocktail. They have a kind of a, a wrenny look to them. So we can find that family. Vireos, so it's like the one on the top, uh, are uh, birds that glean insects off of leaves. And then the, the little warblers have tweezer beak, and they kind of get insects, caterpillars, out of ball moss and between the uh, parts of the bark of trees. So we, we have to study, here's a blackbird. The blackbirds, this is their H-E-B bird, the grackle, the great-tailed grackle. And they have a beak that looks like it was put in a pencil sharpener. Very sharp beak. The orioles, they're not all black, even though they're in the same family. Orioles and metal larks are in this family, but they all have that kind of characteristic beak. We have our sparrow group, little seed-eating birds that are mainly brown, gray, and white. There's four of the 40 species we have in Texas. And so we recognize them, that's the family they're in, they're sparrows. And finches, if it looks like a sparrow, but if it's got red or yellow on it, then it's a finch. We have house finch on the left and goldfinch on the right. Grosbeaks, buntings, and tanagers, all of these birds are in the same general family, the cardinal, the painted bunting, and the summer tanager. So it takes a little practice on these families, and, but once you can figure out what family it's in, it reduces the number of pages you have to look at in the book, and that makes identification easier. You have this um, handout, you have the answers at the bottom of yours, and it's amazing how many birds you can tell. Here's a dovey looking bird on the wire. Here's a little bird with the cocktail of a wren. Here's one with that long beak. This is a metal arc. And then we have an owl. Here's a kingfisher. Here's a duck and so forth. And it's amazing. After you study these, you can be driving along at some speed and see the outline of a bird and actually um, get it to family anyway and identify it later. Now, Tom's going to take us through the next two, the ecoregion and the habitat. So ecoregion, why that word? Well, because it makes an E for chess. Sorry. So the uh, ecoregion really is spelled M-A-P. And 
just like an eco region in Texas, we have the different uh, uh, geographical areas, different plants, which wind up meaning different birds because different birds uh, avail themselves of different food. And the, the, uh, this information will show up in the map, the eco region. So if you were looking for the cardinal, the cardinal shows up in all the eastern United States. Not only is it in the eastern United States, but the color purple in the book, they're color coded, tells you it's there all year long. So we have them all year. You would not go to Oregon to look for a cardinal, okay? And the books will have a, a, a legend for the colors. Uh, this book, the Kaufman book, uh, summer's red, winter is blue, but you got a little bit of that on this evening growth week. And then purple, mix the two colors, you get purple, that's all year long. Here's a couple of other, uh, just to illustrate, if you wanted to find a, a golden-fronted woodpecker, you could look for a golden-fronted woodpecker any time of the year here in Central Texas, uh, because in this green is all year. <clears throat> if you were looking for a northern flicker, they come here in the winter. This is a woodpecker that feeds mostly on the ground, actually. Here's a American kestrel, which is the smallest uh, uh, American or North American little falcon. And he would be here in San Antonio only in the winter. And about the time he leaves, a scissor tail flycatcher, the one on the right, shows up and then he stays. And then about the time he leaves, the kestrel comes back. And then the next thing that we have that we want to pay attention to is habitat. That region, that, that uh, if you look at one of these maps, that's a very large area. You know, this is a very large area. It's almost all of Texas, everything but El Paso, and so, uh, and, and Oklahoma. So you know that bird is not gonna use every habitat in that, uh, in that area. So we look for the habitat, the actual particular type of vegetation and what have you that it uses. And where the, we find that is in the write-up. So like in the cardinal up here, you would get the, the habitat right up is embedded in this writing. So the habitat is really important. You know, you don't look for ducks out in the middle of a pasture generally, and you generally don't look for uh, pelicans in the, in, the, in the middle of a pasture, but you would look for other things there. So this is the habitat. It's a really important idea. Woodpeckers, you, you not, the pond. <laughs> not normally float across in a pond, right? So that's the idea of habitat. Here's some habitats that, that are for real. This is Mitchell Lake. The top one is Bird Pond, which is a small enclosed area with, with uh, vegetation all around the edges. And there you would find the least grebe actually breeding there. And the picture below is a picture of actual Mitchell Lake. This is five or 600 acres of water. Well, you would find pelicans out in the middle of that, but you would not find that least grebe. Uh, the golden cheek warbler at the top, uh, an endangered species that's here in Central Texas. All the golden cheeks are hatched in Central Texas in the uh, juniper oak woodland, and that's the only place they uh, nest and are here. Uh, Roadrunner <clears throat> uses brush country. Uh, this is scrubby, brushy, open cactus, what have you, uh, mesquite. And even if he's on a highway, like down there at the bottom, I can tell you off the edge of that highway is not woodlands. It'll be, it'd be brushland. Here we have two pictures from Civil Oak Nature Center. We have the tall grass prairie at the top where you would find uh, sparrows like this Vesper sparrow. They eat the small seeds, the grass seeds. But then if you were looking for the green kingfisher, you would go to the creek because what he does is he runs up and down the creek uh, looking for food in the water. And so you're not going to find the sparrows in the middle of the creek and you're not going to find the kingfisher uh, out in the, uh, in the prairie. So this is, these are good examples of habitat. The next we're going to talk about color patterns, not just color, but patterns. Okay, now we're getting to the part where I drank it all. I drank, I'm drinking your water. Here you go. All right. Now color pattern, that is just what we want to start with a lot of times, and that's fine, but we, we need to look at these other things too. So if we go to, here's what we get a lot of times. It was a red bird. Can you help me 
identify it. Well, what was it? I said, well, what kind of beak does it have? Huh? What kind of beak? I don't know. So what we want to get away from is the concentration on just color. And we know that the cardinal's red is two, uh, but they're here at different times of the year. They have different color and shape beaks, and they're even different color red. But we want to look at, we want to go beyond that, as we've mentioned. And if you look in the, the field guide, and here in Kaufman, another thing we really like about that is you see these little arrow things? It says, notice this, notice this. This is important to notice. Okay, and if it has an arrow here, it'll have something over in the text to uh, refer to that. And so it makes us notice what we call feel marks, things that are important to see. Sometimes it's a color, sometimes it's a shape. And when you're looking at birds, as Tom alluded to earlier, you want to look at everything you can while you've got your, that bird in your view. Uh, if you take a quick look and then go to your book, the bird may be gone because birds fly. Books don't fly and you can look at that as long as you want to. So we want to get as much as we can uh, in the time we have that bird in view. And you notice there's different patterns. There's bars and there's spots and there's stripes and things like that. And that means we have to learn a little bit about the bird's body. And if the, they may say in the book, Look at the color of the lores. Well, what the heck is that? Well, where the two sides of the beak come together and where the front of the eye is, see that area there? Those are called the lores on a bird. That's not a word we use in everyday language. And you, all the good field guides have a diagram like this to tell you the words they're gonna be using in describing the birds inside. And the best way to learn them is when you need them. If you try to sit down and learn them all at one time, they kind of muddle together. And you also want to notice the parts of the bird when they're in flight, because a lot of times we can see feel marks on a bird uh, when it flies that we cannot see when the wings and the tail are folded. So we want to uh, get a little bit of information about that. Now, the last thing in the list is play, play chess backwards. Well, that means behaviors that can help us with the ID. So if we look at the, um, go back to the text in the field guide here, behavior is often mentioned in the text, especially if it's something that is characteristics of, of the bird. Now that leads us back uh, to the song because they do describe the songs of these birds, but I have a difficult time knowing what that sounds like. I have to use the app on my phone. And in your reference sheet, we have some apps that you can use on your phone or on your computer to actually listen to the sounds of the birds. But here are some things to look at. Some birds fly, they, they fly in different ways. We have some that's like, like straight arrow. And then here, this bird kind of spirals upward and then goes off in flight. These birds, it's what they call undulating flight. It's kind of like riding a roller coaster. They go up and when they fold their wings, they go down, then they flap and then they go down. So those characteristics, which you can see a long way off, can help you with a clue for the bird. Some birds feed in different ways. This is a plover and this is a sandpiper. Plovers have little short beaks. They pick up stuff off the surface. So they run along, pick up something, spy something else and run back to get it. Sandpipers have a longer beak. They walk along slowly and probe in the sand and the, and the mud. So even way away, you can see that kind of behavior. This is one of our uh, uh, flycatchers. The Phoebe flies out, catches a bug, comes back to eat it, and always wags its tail. So you can see that from a way, a way far off. Now, so all of these things are clues and they all help. If you get as much of this information, especially the silhouette is so important, then you are into the Ken Kaufman four-step ID path. And here's what Ken says. You use the silhouette to figure out what general group of bird you're looking at. You go to that part of your book. And when you've looked at the bird, you've painted a picture in your mind of the color patterns and the field marks. And then you're looking for the best match within that group of birds. Now keep in mind that birds do not always look like the picture in the guidebook. 
I don't look like my passport picture, and for that I'm very grateful. They but don't, they don't look the same in each guidebook, and they look different in different guidebooks. So you you don't always get a perfect match, but you usually get the best match. Okay, then you check the map and the text to be sure you're, you know, that you're in the right part of the country. If you if you are in a group and you say I saw this woodpecker and that woodpecker only exists in Oregon. It's kind of embarrassing. Uh, now, it's very unlikely that that bird is going to be in Texas. Sometimes birds get lost and we get rare birds. And if it really is, we want to take a picture of it and be sure we can document it. But play the odds. Go for the birds that are expected in the area and the habitat that you're in. And then a behavior and voice can be done through the app or through the text in the, in the guidebook. So, now we come to the practice, and we are just about out of time, so I'm going to make this short. Um, that means going out into the field and looking at birds. So let's just look at a couple of them. Here we have two birds that obviously are in the duck family, right? Most people have seen this one. This is a mallard, and we see that down by the river, their little green head, and they have a white bow tie and a rusty chest. Well, it's a ducky thing, okay? It's got a bill like a duck. And then we go out to Mitchell Lake and you see this one. Well, obviously it's a duck, but look at the difference. Even though it has a green head, look at the differences. It is a different species. So we would go to the duck section of our book and we would find the one that matches the field marks of this bird. And we would find it was a Northern shoveler, which is a cousin of the mallard. This one, we have the city pigeon. We've all seen this one down on the river walk. We see this bird, obviously in the pigeon family. Dove and pigeon are about the same. And we see this big white stripe on the wing. We go to our book, we look at a large pigeon, and we find that it's the white winged dove. We might notice it has a red eye. It wears blue eyeshadow. It has a beauty mark. And that would help to confirm our ID. Okay? So, you can practice on the birds that are in your yard and uh, be sure you know their families and be sure you can kind of put them in, align them with whatever group they are, and that'll help you with your practice. Now, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip through quickly here. We have two white waiting birds. Go to that section of the book to distinguish the great egret from the snowy egret. Here's a big clue yellow feet, yellow lures, remember. Black bill, black legs, yellow lures, yellow feet. This one has a yellow beak and all black legs and feet. And it's that big, much bigger too. Two woodpeckers, you can practice on distinguishing those. One's the golden fronted and on the left and the ladder back, both in our area. And the three birds here are all black, but they're not all black birds. We have this one, and this one have that right, sharp beak. They are blackbirds. This one is a crow, okay? So you can distinguish those. Now, because we're not gonna go out in the field, we're not gonna spend a, any time on the field craft at this point, but you can certainly go to um, the, um, huh? ABA. To the, huh? ABA has. Anyway. Uh, just one thing I want to mention here about field craft. We want to respect the birds at all costs. So we don't want to harass them and scare them and get up too close, especially if they're breeding. And we want to respect our fellow birders. So don't step in front of other birders. <laughs> there's an etiquette and then there's an ethics to birding as well. And you learn if you bird alone, you learn if you bird in groups. Either way, you can learn a lot. And we'll hope to be able to do that with you after all this uh, where we can't get together is over. Now, the last thing we want to mention is to record your bird sightings and to share them. There's an app for that. There's a, an app called eBird that you can get for free on your phone and record what you see, where you see it, and so forth. And what that does is it contributes to bird conservation because your data goes to the bird conservationists and all the other birders in the world who wanna come here to see the birds. You can actually contribute to the data 
and then you can use the data that other birders have contributed to help you pull a list off for wherever you want to go birding. Find out what you can keep a list of all the birds you've seen in your life, a life list if you want to do that. eBird helps you do it and it's free. There's a free course online called eBird Essentials. Each class, there's about five little lessons and each one's about 10 minutes. And if you will do that, you will have uh, all the essentials you need to be a good eBirder. Now, the last uh, handout that we have here is how to build your birding skills on your own. Uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology puts out this wonderful Merlin. It helps you, what it does is it asks you the questions that we've taught you today, and it helps you zoom in on the bird that you saw. Uh, we mentioned eBird to share your data and to uh, mine the data for information. And you might want to join a bird-friendly group. Uh, Bear Audubon chapter of National Audubon, we are involved in that group, and we'd love to have you as a member. Uh, there's our email on the bottom, but it's also on, huh? Website. Yeah, our website. And then on all of the handouts, our email is on the bottom. So you can contact us if you have questions. And we would love to have you as a member of our flock, uh, bearaudubon.org. You can get all the information there. Now, to end the session today, uh, we, Tom's going to take us through what we like to call a binocular boot camp and five minutes or so of how to set your binoculars and use them like a real professional birder. So Tom, I'm going to stop this um, slideshow so we can see you well. And there is Lisa. Okay. okay, so we'll race through this to try to respect your time. Um, the uh, binoculars, first thing we do, tell people to do is get a comfortable strap and use it, put them around your neck because you would need to be able to uh, put your hands on them without having to look for them at all. First thing I would, I'm not gonna do that so I can flash these around. Let me move back a little bit where you get a better picture. Okay, the, a really important element is if they have lens caps, you should take those off. I think that's pretty self-evident, but it's really dark and it's amazing. You watch some people, sometimes I can't see, and you look over there. They've hit, hit the thing with their hand. Now, do you wear glasses or do you not wear glasses? If you would go out without binoculars to look around for birds or whatever, and you would wear glasses, you should also wear glasses when you use binoculars because it'll become obvious in just a moment. So if I wear glasses, then when I put the binoculars up to my face, my glasses hold the binocular lens off of my eye the appropriate distance so that they focus sharply. If I don't wear glasses, this model, you twist the cup up. You can see how these are different uh, heights. So this one would be without glasses, with glasses, okay? And they both twist. I'll put them down, I have glasses. Next thing is they do this, which changes the distance between the two barrels. We want to align those to our eyes so that each barrel is with our eyes is looking at the same thing. We're not looking at two things. So what we do is we flare them out, we put them up to our face and we fold them together until we get one circle. Not that thing in the movies with the figure eight thing, because we want one circle, everything's looking at one at the same thing, okay? Another thing. Focusing. Binoculars have a central focus, which in here is a knob. Some have a rocker arm up here, different things, but whatever. They'll have a central focus. You want one that has central focus. Okay, that focuses both barrels at once. Also, this ring on the bottom of the right lens, uh, typically at the, at the under the eye cup, is stiff, but it, if you can see that that's rotating, you can see it in the light. What that does is that focuses this barrel independently of this one. And what that makes fit for any difference between our eyes or any difference in the binoculars themselves, actually. And so what we do is we, we're going to start with, we can do this. This one is independent. So let's use the central focus. And we're going to cover the lens that 
has a separate focus. And then we're going to choose something, say 15, 20 feet away, and something with sharp edges, a sign or something is very something good. Something you can and read is something some, really good to use. Yeah, something that you can really home in on because you want to, with your hands held over that right lens and your both eyes open, you focus until you get it really sharp. Once you've done that, you cover the lens that you just focused. You do not focus with that same focus ring because you just did that one. Now you focus on the same thing and you grab this little ring at the base of the right one. And what you want to do now is put it back up to your eye and you want to fine tune that one to get it just as sharp as you can. Then you no longer need to deal with this one. From now on, that's set for your eyes. You only use the central focus and it focuses both lenses. Next thing, how do you hold binoculars? Well, you hold them like a big hamburger. So keep the pickles and the onions trapped, okay? Put them in your hands, and that also gives you good, it's stable, and it gives you good access to the, uh, the, the focus. And also, no flying, elbows down, just a natural, because sometimes you're gonna find yourself looking at a bird for an extended period, wishing, it would move so you can see something that you need to see, okay? And the other thing, how, this is really important, how do you get on a bird whenever you're trying to find uh, something in the binoculars? Well, one of the reasons for keeping your glasses on is you find it with your eyes without the binoculars. So you look and you see the movement, you see the bird, and what you do then is you reach down, you pick up your binoculars and you stare like a laser. And then you pick up your binoculars and you make them line up with where you are already looking. None of this. And then, uh, and then you focus in on it. And if you, you focus and, it's, and it moves, well, just drop them down a little bit and look for it with your eye and do that same thing again. You'll get on stuff just like that and you won't miss them. And when you start doing this, you're looking down that BB gun. You're looking down, even a, even a 12 gauge shotgun barrel is a lot smaller than my peripheral vision. So, okay. So I think that's pretty much it. Yep. So you've got this, you've got these, you've got this separate adjustment, you hold them and you, you find it with your eye and you focus on it. The end to the binocular boot camp. And all of this is on the resource sheet that we shared uh, for, uh, in the binocular guide at the very end of it it goes through those steps so if you can't remember them all just cookbook it and go straight through and you'll be fine uh okay so teresa if anybody's got any questions <sighs> you know what i don't think anybody has any questions and that was a thorough and wonderful talk i think you answered everything that anybody could have asked well either that or they're sitting there stunned and like drinking out of a fire hose for an hour we know it is quite is is very fast but you know there's not a lot of things that you really need to know before you go and then it amounts to just getting out and enjoying the birds and if you run into questions which a lot of people do if you're birding in a group there's usually someone there with a little bit more experience and they'll be able to help you. Um, we are also a resource that we would um, love to help you. And if you send us a picture of a bird and ask us what it is, we will say that we will not tell you. Uh, <laughs> what we will do is send it back to you and say, well, what do you think it is and why? And we will ask you the questions that we just taught you. So, so, so if you tell us what you think it is first and why, why is important, yeah. then you'll speed things up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we had one question just come in. They were asking if you could go over the difference between um, the binocular use with and without glasses. Yes. Okay. I can. What happens is the binoculars, the eye cups, the piece, the, the eye piece is on most binoculars nowadays that you would purchase for birding. The, they, they have a big coarse thread. They twist up to make them longer if you don't wear glasses. In other words, if I wear glasses, my glasses set away from my eye. And so when I put this up to my glasses, that the lens of the binocular is the appropriate distance from my eyeball such that the, folk, that the image is sharp to my eye. And if I don't wear glasses, 
if I don't wear glasses, I would either have to hold these off of my face a little bit, or I can just twist up the cups, both of them up, and they, and then I can put them to my eye, and it's the right distance away from my eye for the for it to be sharp. It also affects your your field of view and some other things, but the main thing is to get a sharp focus. And the only thing I would add to that, uh, Tom's really good on this, is if you have some really old binoculars and they have like a little rubber cup, this is the binoculars I started with and I could never see out of them because I've worn glasses all my life. The little rubber cups stick up and they, they were holding the glasses too far away from my eyes. Those you can roll down if you wear glasses. If you've got the old style of binoculars that have those rubber fold down, you fold them down if you wear glasses. And if you don't wear glasses, you leave them up. I, I would it also, was a miracle for me. I could use them. I would also say that if you are really serious, interested in, in looking at birds, and you have binoculars that have those rubber cups on them, you probably need a better set of binoculars. <laughs> or newer. Because, because you, they may have been in the trunk of your car for quite a while. But binoculars in the last, say, 10, 15 years, optics are immeasurably better than what they used to be. I mean, they really are a lot better. So if you have questions about particular binoculars, we would be more than happy. We don't get any money from any binocular makers, but there are some, certainly some good ones that you can, uh, we can recommend depending on what price range you want to go to. So uh, please ask us those questions. I, I would restress, spend all you can possibly imagine spending because you're going to use them a long time. And, and, and the difference, the price, you know, the curve isn't straight, but in the beginning, an extra hundred dollars or an extra two hundred dollars is a lot of difference in the optics in the view. And what we found is really good is you can always hand down binoculars to your children and your grandchildren <laughs> and then when you get ready to go up <laughs> you can endow them with the binoculars you used to use. So hope that so, helps. Somebody else asked what about scopes? What are they useful for? What are they? I'm sorry the last part? What are scopes used for? Oh, scopes. Well, they're used for things that these don't have enough horsepower for, like particularly like shorebirds or something at great distance. You know, so oftentimes, like shorebirds, you will use a scope because a scope generally is going to be 20 to 60 power. These are going to be eight power. And so it draws it up a lot closer. But I would say to you, spend a lot of money on binoculars before you start dealing with a scope. Go with somebody that's got one, because if you need a scope, you need a good one. Because, I mean, the optics are, it makes sense. And if you go on an organized birding walk or birding trip, uh, nine times out of 10, that if it's needed, um, the uh, leader will have a scope available that everyone can share. Like if we go to Mitchell Lake, we have an older scope, which is still a good scope, and a newer one, we'll, we'll take both scopes, and we're happy to share them, because scopes are, you set it up on something, they're also used typically for things that are more stationary. So if you've got a duck or something out way out there, you can zoom it up close, and you just leave it set, and then other people can come and take a look. And I will say this about most bird watchers, they're very happy to share with you. And uh, even if, let's say they had a set of binoculars, you think, oh, I'm thinking about buying some of those. They'll probably let you try them, you know, and put them up. And uh, so just ask, and uh, especially if it's the leader of a group, they'll, they'll be more than happy to help you. Great. We have one last question and then we'll wrap it up after this. Okay. Uh, uh, somebody asked, what should they wear for birding? They've been getting killed by mosquitoes. Ah, very good question. Um, the, the one thing, uh, let me just start with this. If you use mosquito repellent, the one thing you don't want to do is get it on your lenses. If you're spraying, you'll see us run like crazy when people start getting the skater spray out. Because if you get that, it'll take the coatings off of your binoculars. The stuff, the stuff you paid the extra $400 for. It'll, it'll take it, it off. <laughs> so, and it'll also mess up the outsides of your binoculars. So uh, as far as wearing, you can get these, like Fisher, people wear uh, to go fishing, these long sleeve nylon shirts. 
that are really good to keep the mosquitoes off of you. Some people wear a light glove on their, their hands. You can even get bug away shirts that are impregnated with a substance that uh, deters insects. And if you, have, if you have a real, like sometimes when we go on a trip, maybe foreign trip, and we're expecting to have a lot of insect load, um, you can buy a, a, a material called pyrethrin. I get it at uh, Academy. Academy. And basically you saturate the clothes that you're gonna take and you let it dry. And then it's good for several washings and like mm -hmm. six weeks and it helps. Uh, and light color, uh, you know, light colored, neutral color. You don't want to wear white because it makes you stand out in the in the habitat. But like a light green or a light uh, neutral colors also deter mosquitoes as well. Great. Well, red attracts you. hummingbirds. <laughs> red attracts hummingbirds. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. That was a wonderful talk, Patsy. Thank, thank you. you guys. We really, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate. We're happy to help you. Great, and if anybody's interested in learning more about the Bear Audubon Society, please visit bearaudubon.org. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about Harberger Park and the conservancy that supports it, please visit us at our uh, website at philharbergerpark.org. Um, again, we're a, no a donation-based nonprofit that supports educational activities in the park. And if you're able to give a little bit something today to support programs like this, we would really appreciate it. Uh, it's a great place to go birding too. <laughs> it is. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks.